You're listening to Making Waves, fresh ideas in freshwater science. Making Waves is a monthly podcast where we talk about new ideas in freshwater science and why they matter to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science. Hi, I'm your host, Tim Klein. This month's podcast is a little different than usual as we shift from a focus on outstanding scientific research to an interesting story of how concerned citizens who care about their local waterways can take action into their own hands to improve stewardship, educate, and even monitor those waterways that they care about most. My guest today is Kelly Stetner, the director of the Black River Action Team, a grassroots watershed organization in Vermont. Kelly is going to tell us a little bit about how she started the Black River Action Team, how they've grown, and what they're doing now. Well, thanks for agreeing to do this. I'm excited about about this topic. So, well, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. You guys are interested, so that's very cool. I guess. How did you get started with the the Black River Action Team? Well, that's actually one of my favorite stories. Um, back in uh, 2000, my husband John and I had just moved to Springfield, Vermont, and we had a little daughter. She wasn't even two yet. And uh, we were walking across a bridge over the river near our new house, our new home. And I, I always love to look in the rivers. I always love to see if there's, you know, fish, turtles, beavers, ducks, anything down there. And instead, what was looking back at me was shopping carts and tires and cinder blocks. So I made the mistake of saying out loud what I was thinking, which was that, man, that's really terrible. Somebody should just do something about that. Because my husband was right there, and he elbowed me in the ribs and said, well, you're somebody. So that that pretty much got things started. That, that got the ball rolling on the river cleanups. Um, but I, I'm a secretary by day. been with the same company for 20 years. Um, so anything I was going to do on the river was going to end up being in my spare time. But we got, I got together with a couple of my coworkers, my husband and our daughter. For I had, I had them for about an hour and a half before she had to go home for a nap which I had, um, but we managed to clean about 200 feet of riverbank and pulled out a dozen shopping carts, a handful of tires, some yard sale signs, um, a few bags of household trash. Took a, took us about four hours, uh, and boy, we were retired when we were done, and I kind of thought, you know, that's it, we're done. But the next year, one of those coworkers gave me another elbow in the ribs and said, hey, we're doing that river thing again okay, well, let's pick a Saturday and let's do it because this is all spare time. It's all grassroots. It's all volunteers, and we did it again. And we had about a dozen high school kids coming to help us and a couple more coworkers. Before you know it, this has become an annual event. People bring their kids. Uh, I've got one family. They bring their grandkids. Um, Scout packs come out to help. We've got football players, the Rotary Club. I've had um, one of my favorite photos is a wet, muddy, rainy, cold day, and we had the uh, guy running for local representative from the Democrat Party and the guy running for representative from the Republican Party working side by side, almost hand in hand, to pull a shopping cart out of the mud. It was great. So what started as as this river sweep has now evolved into much more, and I think you mentioned you were doing some educational outreach using bugs and and, uh, using bugs to teach about water quality. We are, and that that's kind of, it, I've, being a part-time thing that I've really had to do in my spare time uh, with no money, I've had to get very creative and outside the box. So looking at water quality, I wanted to, just, I wanted to do something with water quality since our second cleanup in 2001, but I had no money, no volunteers, and no real know-how. You know, how am I going to get these samples to the lab? How am I going to pay for the tests? No idea what I was doing. You know, what would I even do with the results if I got the tests back? I don't even know what that means. Um, so I got talking with the guys at the state, and they said, you know, start looking at benthic macroinvertebrates. I said, what? But they explained, <laughs> they explained how river bugs really do uh, provide an overall sense of the water health. And they explained why. You know, I'm looking at, and, and I needed it in layman's terms, you know, for myself as a self-taught person. And also for the people that I, I do bug hunts with, I needed to be able to talk to them about, you know, how to tell a stonefly larva from a mayfly larva um, when you're looking at it in an ice cube tray under a magnifying glass. Um, and it's it's been really, really interesting for me to take uh, river bugs 
to everything from the local wildlife festival to uh, I bring them into schools sometimes. We homeschool our two kids and our older daughter, uh, who is now 17, she's been coming with me to the school since she was about eight and doing bug hunts in the classrooms with the kids. And we use them for everything from learning about the food web to learning about um, physical adaptations of these creatures and how they inform water chemistry um, concepts for the older kids. And it's kind of led to even more because even though we started a water quality monitoring program since Tropical Storm Irene hit, we've been using the river bugs to look below the surface and just this last, it's taken me about three years worth of research and, and prep work to line up um, a more detailed study of the, of the bugs. We're looking not just at what's on the, you know, below the surface of the water on the riverbed, we're looking at what's under the riverbed. I think that was something that um, kind of piqued your interest too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to talk about that, that'd be great. That, yeah, that would be awesome, and I, I get rolling because I get excited. This is <laughs> well, it's it's been super fun for me because I I'm a desk jockey by day, um, and I guess river superhero by night. I I just you know I'm going planning workshops and and going to events and and you know doing stormwater outreach and all this other stuff in my spare time and on my lunch breaks and um, whatever I can do to spread the word about what we're doing is is a lot of fun for me. Um, so a few years ago, I got contacted by the Regional Planning Commission, and they said, look, you know, Springfield's got this old industrial history, uh, lots of chemicals and um, solvents and stuff used to be kind of poured out in the trench in the backyard behind some of these old factories or stored in big tanks under, underneath the factories or in big vats or what have you. And now, the, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, the factories are empty. They don't – they're not – doing anything anymore and even the owners and developers have uh, dissolved and they're not even around um, to be held accountable for what's left behind once they vacated the premises. One of the biggest uh, brownfields in Springfield, possibly even in Vermont, is the old Jones and Lampson building. It's right on Clinton Street in Springfield, right, up, right in the outskirts of town. And it's about, oh, maybe 100 feet from the Black River and they had all kinds of solvents that they would use to degrease the machine tool parts. And those things would get, um, I don't think at Jones and Lance they were necessarily dumped into trenches, but they were stored in underground tanks, which of course over time are going to leak, degrade, um, and ba basically just break down and release these things into the groundwater. Um, so what we're trying to do, I can't afford um, chemical tests. I can't afford the equipment, and I don't have the time and I can't afford the, the, the testing uh, of, of the water samples if we were to try to collect, let's say, poor water, you know, where the groundwater is going to seep up into the river. Um, that's, that's where we're going to be looking for impact because if it's out of sight, it's out of mind for most people. Um, so what we've been trying to do, and this is what's taken me about three years to figure out, is how best to use river bugs to look at what's coming up out of the groundwater. So we had to start looking below the actual bed of the river at the toe of the contaminated bank. And of course, the Planning Commission said, gee, um, share with us your water quality information, but don't go near the contaminated site yet. We, we really want to have some time to, to try to figure out what's happening in that dirt, in that groundwater, before volunteers are allowed to go poking around in there. Uh, so what we, we worked with the Planning Commission and we worked with the developer who owns the building and the site and we started doing, um, we built colonization tubes. Um, I built four of them and we, we planted two of them in the bed of the river at the toe of the bank about 100 feet upstream and more like 200 feet upstream from the contaminated bank. And the other two are in, were installed about 300 feet downstream of the contaminated bank. And the point of this to start with was, A, let's make all our mistakes now before we're looking at the contaminated site. <laughs> See how we can tweak the study and make it more effective. And B, you know, to refine our goals. The real focus is to allow the male fauna to colonize the sediment that we install in these tubes 
from the groundwater so we can then collect it and start looking under a uh, compound scope and see what's actually there. What might we expect to find as we move closer to the, uh, the contaminated site? So have you collected any of your bugs or is, that, is this ongoing? Well, um, we planted the four tubes in July, went back six weeks later and pulled the uh, three of the four tubes. One of them was actually, we think, vandalized because it was too close to a swimming hole upstream. Uh, couldn't find the tube anywhere, so we presume it's gone. Uh, and the furthest one downstream was vandalized by raccoons. Uh, the duct tape did not hold. <laughs> And we, we collected it anyway, just on the off chance that it wasn't completely useless. But we did get two good samples, and they are right now sitting in my basement with rubbing alcohol and some rose bengal dye to stain the sample. And I'm just waiting on a compound scope, which I should have by the end of the week. Um, and we're going to start. We're going to start looking. And right now, I'm going to start with my two homeschool kids, and we're going to start drop by drop and see what we can find. It's um, it's. To me, it's citizen science at its best because we don't have quite the constraints of you know, the quality control um, rigors that that folks in the in the strict science scientific community have to adhere to. Um, but we basically want to learn about what's down there, see what we can find, see where we messed up, um, you know, make it more raccoon proof and more vandal proof, and do it again next summer and do it better and get more samples. And then, then we'll, and we'll, you know, the more we do it, the better we'll get at it. And then in a couple of years when we're able to access the toe of the contaminated site, we'll have some level of population data to know what we're going to compare it to. Speaking for yourself and also for um, talking to your volunteers, what makes you guys passionate about, about this project, about the, the team and, and, you know, continuing both the monitoring efforts and the cleanups year after year? Um, well, it's funny you should ask that because I've had the cleanup is really the main. It's like our signature event. You know, a hundred people turn out for this thing across five different communities. Uh, we've got local sponsors. We print up T-shirts for everybody. It's a big. Um, it's almost like a party. We even had uh, live music uh, where, where we played music on the on the some of the trash that we brought in. You know, seeing the kids banging around on on um, tires and shopping carts and trying to make musical instruments out of them. We really do have fun with it. Um, but somebody asked me after the after the last one, the last cleanup, man, look at all this junk we pulled out. Look at all these tires, over 40 tires in a two-mile stretch of river. Doesn't that just make you mad? Does, how, how do you not get disheartened? You know, how do you not get discouraged by it? And it, it occurred to me, I had to think about it for a while, but it occurred to me that it's not that... I have a goal for a trash-free river. It's that I have a goal for for people. I want to toss the pebble in and see how many people I can bring in to taking an interest in the health of the river. You know, it really is our river. Stewardship just happens in the backyard, and I, I think that's really that's really the, the impetus for me. That's really the crux of it for me, the, the passion comes from my story. I decided to step up and be somebody, and I want to try to encourage and, and inspire, I hope, other people to step up and say, geez, you know, she can do it, and look at her, she's a secretary. Man, I can do this, I can do, do that and be somebody. I can clean up tires, and I may not know much about river bugs, but I can learn, um, and just kind of be the example for other folks and try to get them to join me in taking care of this river. It's, it's beautiful, it's got a lot to offer, and uh, it really is ours to take care of. This podcast was brought to you with support from the Society for Freshwater Science. For more information about this speaker, the podcast, or the society, please visit www.freshwater-science.org. Be sure to join us each month for more fresh ideas in freshwater science. Thanks for listening.